January 1995. The future of the renowned Seagram Liquor Company is in question. Young CEO Edgar Bronfman Jr. wants to risk his family's empire on the purchase of a Hollywood movie studio, MCA Entertainment. Home to Alfred Hitchcock, Steven Spielberg, Universal Pictures, and MCA Records. For Bronfman, secrecy is crucial. The potential sale of MCA has not yet hit the press. If it does, his chance of acquiring the studio at a price he can afford will be in serious jeopardy. You could end up with a bidding war. You could end up paying a lot more money than it's worth if you really want it. Or you could, somebody else could end up paying it a lot more than it's worth and, and you get shut out. Back in Japan, MCA's owner, Matsushita, also wants a quiet sale. But big deals make for good copy and don't stay quiet for long. I think secrecy is always important in every deal, and our job as journalists is to try to find the weak link in that secret chain. On March 6, 1995, Bronfman flies from New York to Osaka, Japan, for a secret meeting with Yoshi Morishita, president of Matsushita Electronics. Well, I, I hopped on the corporate plane uh, because, again, this was supposed to be extremely uh, secret, so I didn't want to book a flight ticket. The next day in Osaka, Japan, Bronfman and Marishita meet for two days in a private guest house. Marishita tells Bronfman that Matsushita only wants to sell 80% of MCA, retaining the rest as a silent investor. Bronfman agrees in principle. At that stage, there was no discussion about price. There was really discussion about process. Uh, there was a kind of getting to know you and feeling each other out. Edgar uh, played a truly crucial role in getting uh, the management of Mashusta to embrace the possibility of a Seagram's purchase. Being able to convey the history of Seagram's and the history of his family made a very important impression. To maintain secrecy, Bronfman and Marishta agree to a two-month exclusive negotiating window during which Seagram can explore the possibility of buying MCA. I was not at all sure, however, that we would be able to get a deal done because I, did, I still didn't know his price expectations, which I thought would be significant. Uh, and I was very concerned that if we bought this company, we did it on a, on a financially prudent basis. But back in New York, the definition of prudent varies in the Bronfman family. With a price tag of at least $5 billion for an 80% stake in MCA, Edgar Bronfman Jr. knows there is only one way Seagram can raise the money. It must sell its most prized and lucrative investment, a 24% stake in the chemical giant DuPont. In those days, DuPont was a very powerful company. It had wonderful brands. It had a global reach, and it was something that they could always count on year in and year out. It looked like a real blue-chip investment for forever. Edgar Bronfman Jr. knows that selling DuPont may be a tough sale for his father and his uncle. In particular, it's highly unlikely Uncle Charles will favor hawking the family's $8 billion crown jewel so that he can invest in Hollywood. I think different people have different tolerances for risk. Uh, and I think my uncle's tolerance for risk is quite low. And the status quo is essentially risk-free in his, in his mind, not, not in mine. Bronfman was looking down the line at telecommunications advances, some of the advances in, in technology, and was saying entertainment is going to benefit from these things, and this is where we should be. To make the best pitch possible, Edgar Jr. sets out to create a proposal for Seagram's board of directors, including his uncle Charles. March 10th. New York City. Two days after returning from Japan, Edgar Bronfman retains investment banking firm Credit Suisse First Boston to determine a value for the renowned entertainment company. Leading the team of advisors from First Boston is Brian Finn, a high-powered investment banker that Edgar Bronfman Jr. is counting on to find the right price for MCA. Edgar's message to us was that an opportunity was available to acquire a controlling interest in MCA, and if it could be done on attractive terms, he was prepared to recommend it to his family and the board of directors. Five days later, on March 15th, on the fifth floor of Seagram Corporate Headquarters in New York City, 
CEO Edgar Bronfman Jr. makes a presentation to Seagram's board of directors. He proposes selling DuPont and buying MCA. The board's reaction, I think, was generally, was, as I recall, generally positive. The board was very supportive of my view that we could create value at MCA. Everyone agrees. Everyone except Edgar's uncle, Charles Bronfman. He voiced his concern uh, that, uh, that this was a very risky investment uh, and asked the board to consider the fact that it was a risky investment. But he made it clear to the board that he did not want to sell the DuPont stake uh, and did not want to buy uh, MCA. Charles was saying, now look, wh why are we doing this? Uh, tell me again what we're going for here. We have steady. You're going for boom or bust. I I'll take steady. But Edgar Bronfman Sr. says the move will ideally position Seagram for substantial profit and growth in the decades to come. Although Charles disagrees, he grants Edgar Jr. permission to continue discussions with Matsushita, provided he makes no commitments to buy MCA. Two weeks later, Edgar Bronfman Jr. secretly flies to Osaka to talk price with Matsushita President Yoshi Morishita. This was a critical meeting because uh, if their price expectations were simply uh, too high, uh, the deal was off. In Osaka, Bronfman tells Marishta that Seagram values MCA at $6.5 billion. Marishta responds that Matsushita places MCA's value at $7.2 billion, a $700 million difference. The two agree to turn the bidding over to their investment banking teams for further negotiations. But aware that they can only keep the deal out of the press for so long, Bronfman and Marishita set an incredibly quick deadline. Their bankers must reach a purchase price for MCA in just 21 days. Otherwise, the deal is off. I felt that coming to terms and a handshake on price uh, was still a long distance from a completed deal. We still had board approvals from both companies. Uh, so I, didn't, I wasn't particularly confident of the transaction closing. Then, just days after his return to New York, Edgar Bronfman Jr.'s worst fear comes true. On Saturday, April 1st, the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times simultaneously run stories that MCA is up for sale. Bronfman is mortified. Desperate to do a deal before hostile outside bidding begins, he calls Marishita in Osaka and demands immediate action. And I said, we've got to sign this deal by next Sunday. And I said to him, I'm sitting here with my general counsel, who assures me that it's not possible, uh, that we cannot get all these contracts written uh, and organized in one week's time. And I said to him, I'm, I'm instructing our law firm that they have no choice but to do that, and I hope you'll instruct your law firm the same way. Marishita agrees to try to reach an agreement in one week's time by Sunday, April 9th. Bronfman has seven days to close a multi-billion dollar deal that will change the future of the family business. Standing in his way are two enormous obstacles, a $700 million gap in price and a conservative, powerful uncle who wants no part of the deal. My uncle effectively had a veto, uh, and uh, the question I still did not know was whether or not he would exercise that veto. 